Okay, thanks everyone for coming and for letting us be here with you tonight. We're so excited to be here. Happy Valentine's Day for those who celebrate Valentine's Day. And um, let's see, I, I was, I'm in charge of introducing us. So we are Stan and Alicia Moulton and we run the Honey Company out of Spring City, Utah. Stan's um, a fourth generation beekeeper and so our kids that will do a little bit tonight are fifth generation beekeepers. And then he's been keeping bees full time for about 30 years. So he eats, sleeps, breathes bees, <laughs> right? Like he just reads all kinds of books about it and he's had a lot of practical, practical experience. And he often says like, I've killed more colonies than you ever will. <laughs> so he's learned, he's learned a lot through the School of Hard Knocks too. Um, so just wanted to start off with, uh, we have, been working for about a year to create some online courses about beekeeping. So tonight you'll, we'll teach you how to get started with bees, but once you get a beehive, then you're going to need a lot more information. Um, so we're, we put together some online courses. There are six of them. The first one is free. It's called My First Colony, and a lot of what we talk about tonight will be involved in that. And then there are some paid courses like basic beekeeping skills, things like how to open a hive, how to approach it for the first time, how to super the hive, how to, and it's really just step-by-step, -step, really practical information. The third course is how is my queen? So in the middle of the summer, if you have a queen bee and something happens to her and <laughs> you're really worried about it, you're gonna wanna turn to this course because it will have like a troubleshooting guide so you know what to do with your queen. The fourth course is called Are They Healthy? And that talks about honeybee diseases and pests. Not all of them, but just like the most common ones that we've experienced in our um, ex long time of beekeeping, I guess. Um, the fifth course is Is There Honey? So that's about extracting honey, harvesting honey, bottling honey. We show you our honey room and everything that we do to get the honey ready and then we have a big section in that about rendering beeswax and making beeswax products tons of recipes hands-on stuff and then the sixth course is an advanced beekeeping course called queen rearing so if you've kept bees for a while and have access to multiple apiaries then you can take a queen rearing course and learn how to raise your own queens using the doolittle or grafting method so if you want to sign up for our course the first one's free again so i'm going to pass around this um sign up sheet and if you want to be on the honey company email list please write down your name and email and then what I will do is I will send you an email after this class and inviting you to join because our anyway the way the email law works is that you can't just I can't just sign up for you so I'll send you a link and you can um, join our email list and you can get yeah do you want to start sending that around perfect and then Let's see, if you sign up for one of our courses, okay, I'm being really confusing, but we have two email lists going, which is confusing. One is just the general email list if you wanna just be notified about general things. But if you sign up for one of our courses, then we have a series of emails called our 52 beekeeping emails. So that will be one email every week that tells you what you need to know about beekeeping for that week. And so it will give you like step-by-step -step guides, like when it's time to feed your bees, we'll send you an email, here's how to feed bees, right? And it's really, it's gonna be a really valuable tool and I've been working really hard on it. Okay, so let's see, we're gonna have um, a YouTube live session on March 16th at seven o'clock. If you wanna join us on YouTube, we have hundreds of YouTube videos about beekeeping up and our channel's called The Honey Company um, and that, so if you want to have any questions that didn't get answered tonight, you can send us your questions and we'll answer them live on the internet. Um, it's at seven. Yep. Um, so you can email us your questions or you can ask them live that night. And then we have some honey and beekeeping veils and other products over there that are for sale. And um, except for the honey, everything is 30% off tonight if you want to buy something. Don't feel obligated. We're just doing this because we love to teach classes. But if, if you are interested in that, it's there. And the honey's not on sale because we already try to keep it the price as low as we can. Okay, so then the next business thing is we have these um, handouts. And so luckily I printed 30 of them and there are a lot more than 30 of you here. So I'll start them a pile on each side. If you guys could take one per family. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, okay, perfect. That would be great. So a PDF. Okay, we can do that. So on the first list, you guys, I'm still learning about all this, but notice that I did it in yellow, and I'm really sorry because you can't read yellow. <laughs> right? So I'm doing, we're, we'll correct that before we send out the PDF. So Stan, do you want to hand that out? Just start a pile on that side, and we'll send. So on the front of this is the checklist. This is what we're going to be talking about today. And then on the back is what's included in each of the courses. So, you know. Okay. Can I start over here and pass yeah. it around? Okay. And then with that, I'm going to, we're going to talk about what you need to start your first hive. And we're going to have Clara, our daughter, who is almost 14, she's going to come up and talk to you about bee veils. Hang on, you're going to be mic. So come right in the front. Okay. Go in the front of the table, okay. So a bee veil is. Okay. A bee veil is something you only wear over your head, like this one. It is one my mom made. Oh, sorry. A bee veil is the part piece that you wear over your head, and it's not a lot of protection, but it's probably the most comfortable because you're not having all the equipment. And it's probably better for working out in the summer because, you know, overheating. And, <laughs> yes, this, yes, a bee jacket is the bee veil and a, <laughs> Eggs. absolutely, it's attached to a long sleeved kind of sting proof jacket. And this is more protection, less comfort, and You want gloves, long pants, and make sure there's not a gap because the bees will know. They can smell your fear. <laughs> and the bee suit is the whole, whole ensemble, the headpiece, jacket, and pants. And this is the most uncomfortable, but, you know, if you're allergic or just really don't want to get stung, this is your best bet. And bee gloves. You'll probably want these with all of them. The difference between, these are my dad's, he has his initials, but they're pretty standard. The difference between normal board gloves and bee gloves is the gauntlet sleeve fabric. And that will keep the bees from crawling up your sleeves and seeing you in the arm. Again, they will know. And that's pretty much it. All right, and now Elizabeth is gonna come up here and she's gonna tell you about the bee smoker. Okay. She is a. You have to speak real loud, though. Okay. Go up in the front. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Moulton, and I'm going to speak about the bee smoker. Um, so, if you're gonna light it, you have to get out. You. If you get it open, you get it open, and you see we use burlap because it creates a lot of smoke. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's a stupid question. Mm -hmm. um, what's a bee smoker used for? It's to smoke. So you smoke it like in little holes and it like calms the bees down. And it like, it like, it, yeah, it like smokes the angry pheromones. pheromones. <coughs> Yeah. So then they use if you don't have smoke, then they'll like send pheromones everywhere and then all the bees will know this is a threat. Sting them. But if you have smoke then they won't know. And and if you if you take out the, to light Yeah, when you light the smoker you want to light it from the bottom and then stick it in. Then and then close it and then it'll and then you want to pump it. And then it'll event and it'll make smoke and you can smoke the bees. How far away do you put it from your beehive? You put it like 
right up against it. Could there be flames coming out the end? No. What there should there be? Smoke. There should be smoke. Is there something on the burlap? Um, it's, yeah, it's burnt. Is it goat skin burlap? I, I don't think so. Oh, okay. Just like, there's no, like, lighter fluid or You want to take, you kind of want to suffocate it. You somehow block this and then to stop it. And you don't want to use like dry grass, like you can use grass, but you don't want to use gr dry grass because then it could just light it on fire. So um, you take a wad of green grass and yeah, you, you roll it in your hands to make like a ball and then you put it in and it stops it. Yeah, you can also put it on its side, and then it'll slowly stop eventually. Come here. Awesome. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay. Thank you. Now. Is that it? Did you say anything yep. else? Okay, now Stan's going to talk about all the rest of the stuff. Where's my paper? Oh, yeah. Oh, I got it. Right here. Okay. In case anybody's worried, there's no bees in here. <laughs> it's just, it's an empty box for now. <laughs> so, all right. So thanks for inviting me to, uh, your, uh, to present about bees this evening. Um, so uh, I was uh, giving a presentation to the Utah County beekeepers last week. And I started out the, uh, started out the evening by making a statement that I'm afraid cast a little doom and gloom over the event. I'm not sure. So at, at, at a group like this, though, I am not afraid to uh, repeat that since uh, you're, uh, you're accustomed and not, a, not afraid of a little bad news that might come along. So in the agricultural business, we all know that every year is different. And some, deer, some years we get a uh, bumper crop Sometimes we go, uh, we get a reversal. <laughs> I, my grand, my grandfather used to call uh, call it a reversal. We didn't just break even; we actually had a reversal. So you'll know what I mean if you're uh, if you're in the ag business. And so what I said was, is uh, I quoted myself saying, "Show faith by preparing for the disaster that you will overcome." So I thought that was uh, pretty much encompasses all of agriculture and the fluctuations we have from year to year on, on not just the weather, but all kinds of other things. So the bee health, uh, bee health uh, the industry of the bee health lately has been particularly a tough one. Um, we've got some pests that are just uh, relentless and uh, the ability to overcome those things is taking a little bit too much time, taking more time than we would really like, but somehow we're still here. So, so we're going we're gonna to overcome. We just, uh, it's just taking a little longer than some of the other times that there's been bee troubles. Yes? What are some of the pests and problems you're dealing with? Okay. So I'll just, uh, we can talk a little bit more about those in depth as we go. I'll give you just a quick uh, bullet list of, uh, uh, so the main menace we have right now is called Varroa mite. So it was imported from China, India, that area. And it's a, uh, it's a mite that's, uh, it's visible to the naked eye. It sucks the hemolymph of the bee blood, the insect blood, out of the bee. 
It feeds on the fat bodies and the bee blood. And so that's not the worst part of it though, is it transmits a number of viruses when it does so. And so those viruses can take out the bee colony. And we've been trying to overcome that one since it arrived here in the United States in, in 1987. It wasn't really over all the country and impacting the, the uh, commercial colonies until a little bit later than that, but that's how long it's been here. So we're still working on uh, accomplishing the uh, accomplishing the problem of varroa mite. So there's a, some other diseases that have been around in the bee. Uh, we I hate to start out. I mean, thanks for asking the question, but I hate to start out a discussion about bees and and worry people about bee pests. So there's foul brood. Um, the American foul brood is is a trouble one that's been around for a long time because it's in a spore form. So it's really hard to get rid of. So there's a whole list of other uh, lesser important uh, bee diseases, but those are the two, two main right now. So those are some of the things that have always been killing bees before we got a lot of pesticides going and insecticides. So if we're talking about what's killing the bees, pests are part of it, and then uh, the humans are the rest, I guess. So, so the real culprit for the bee trouble we're having right now is us, the beekeepers, us, the agriculture industry, us, the pesticide uh, industry. So anyway, we're uh, trying to overcome ourselves, I guess. So we have, uh, we'll mention a little bit about our feral bee project tonight, where the bees out in the wild on their own, away from us, they can just get away from us, they're just fine. They're living in trees and rocks out there and doing just fine without us. So we're trying to, as part of our, our business plan is to uh, take some of the genetics and some of those things that the wild bees have to survive on their own and put those into our own operation and to contribute to save the bees in our own little way. So if the, uh, the, the, the brightest minds in the entomology industry with all the government funding that they, they need can't figure out the problem, I'm probably not going to be able to. So, but I say that, uh, I say that with, a, uh, with the uh, idea in mind that I'm going to try, I'm going to contribute what we can to the bee health problem we have right now and, and overall industry. So our bee health is, is related to our, uh, our, the rest of our agriculture, not all of it, but quite a bit of it. And so if we can make a, con a substantial contribution to the bee industry and the bee health, then we'll also contribute to some of the other things that we enjoy uh, as agricultural products. So anyway, that's just a brief about some of the bee troubles we have. Let's move on to some more positive and happy ideas about, uh, so let's say the first note, Can yeah. Tell what is the feral yes, yes I will. So the feral bead project while we're on the subject, so uh, down in southern Utah, so uh, uh, all of southern Utah I guess would say in central Utah too, there's a lot of uh, feral colonies of honeybees. So these bees at one time or another, who knows how long ago, have escaped from somebody's hive somewhere and then they've been living on their own out uh, in the wild. So considering where they are and how far a, a swarm of bees might travel every year, they've been out there for a long time. They're all the way down through canyon lands, all, all the way down the remote, most remote place that you can go to down in southern Utah. If you're there when there's flowers blooming and you're looking on the right flowers, you'll see honeybees on them. So we, we've been catching some of those. We've, caught, we've done some cutouts or we've uh, a cutout, if you're not familiar with that term, is, is where some bees have moved into somebody's structure. In this case, it was a camp trailer. We cut them out of there and put them in a box. And then we uh, used those queens that we got from that. This was down in Monument Valley. We raised some daughters from that and repeat the process. Let them mate down there with their own feral population of drones down there. So we're, we're keeping the genetics. Uh, there's very few places that you could actually keep the genetics really pure, where you could truly have an isolated mating yard for bees. So bees will mate out uh, in, in the air, right? So the queen leaves the beehive. She'll go to a place where all the drones are flying around and she'll mate there and then come back to the hive. So those drone congregation areas, uh, sometimes uh, they'll, uh, in, if you're near population, people, then we'll, uh, we'll have a variety of different bees that show up there. Some of these bees would be from, from package bees that people have bought out of California or Florida or Georgia or wherever and uh, brought them in here. But the unique part about Southern Utah is, is that it's so far away from anybody else that we ensure that the queens are only going to get mated 
by, with the local drone population where that, where that uh, mating hive was put. So we've been catching those, uh, those bees down there for a while and including those in our gene pool and those are the ones we sell to people. So we've got uh, uh, Africanized bees down in St. George, you know. So in Washington County, Kane County, they've got some mean bees down there. So we're not getting our bees from there. We're on the other corner of the state. We're down by Blanding, Four Corners area. And we take the bees that we catch down there and we'll send them into the state. They have an a entomology department. And uh, if they can't perform the test there, they, they can arrange for it to be done. So we send a sample of our bees in there when we catch them and make sure that they're not Africaized. So uh, we don't know exactly what variety they are. We know they're European, but we know they're not Africanized honeybees. And so uh, they make good backyard bees, especially this last year. They were just really calm. The breeder queen that we used for the package bees that we have and the nucleuses that we sell to our customers, um, we, she was just really gentle. I, I rarely put on gloves. Uh, one, uh, this one uh, time I was, I was halfway through the bee yard through the day before I even remembered to put my veil on. I just didn't even have my, my bee hat on. And uh, they were that calm. Well, you so, have to remember that hmm. stands really tough. So yeah. <laughs> I just stung five times and I put on my gloves. <laughs> so, so, right. Right. So you will get stung, but they're not, they're not Africanized mean, right? They're, they've got a fairly good disposition. So hopefully the breeder queens we have this year will be the same. Can't guarantee that. Every year is a little different. And of course, time of day that you get in the beehive uh, makes a difference on how their disposition at the time. Uh, what the weather is doing, high pressure, low pressure, that makes a difference in uh, their uh, attitude that day. Uh, whether you put smoke on them or not, uh, make sure you start your smoker before you get in the beehive. So uh, after that, uh, it's a little bit hard to catch up to make up, make up for that uh, opportunity that you missed. So, yeah. No, so it's, uh, it's actually a good thing to do to smoke bees. We have one of our videos I've got that shows my pants with a whole bunch of bee stingers in them. And so if you smoke the bees, they're going to less likely to sting you. So we know that if a bee stings you, it's got the barb on its stinger and it pulls some of its guts out with it. And so when a bee stings you, it dies. So it's the nicest thing to do is to smoke bees, keep them calm while you're in the hive doing the things that beekeepers do. And uh, make, sure that, uh, make sure that we minimize the stings by using a bee smoker and getting in there uh, at a specific time of day. So we've got an, an orderly list of how these things progress as we talk about them. But while we're on the subject, we might as well just keep going. So the best time of day to get into your beehive would be the middle of a nice, warm, sunny day when there's flowers out. The bees are out busy. So the, the older bees in the hive, the foraging bees, are out busy at work. And so there are, they don't know, they may not even know that you're in a beehive. You might be in there, do what you need to, and be gone before some of the forage bees get back. So, uh, uh, so while half the beehive is out foraging, is a good time to get inside the bee. You don't want to get there too early in the morning, wait till they go to work, and then you don't want to get there too late in the evening when they're all home, right? And then you don't want to get in there on a, on a cold, rainy day. They'll be grumpy. They like to go to work, and if they can't go to work, they're going to be in the hive grumpy, and then you show up without your bee smoker. You're just asking for trouble. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so uh, all right, let's, uh, let's see. Uh, before I got too wound up on this, I was going to ask how many people here uh, are uh, currently beekeepers? Yeah. Okay, we got one, it, two. It depends on how you define beekeeper. Yeah. Uh, we have a beehive <laughs> in, our, in our backyard, but we don't really know. Very good, Linda. Let's, let's define uh, who's currently a beekeeper. You may be intending to be one, but who has alive bees right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we were going to. We were getting to the dead ones. Who got them through the winter? Okay, we got three people maybe. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're not sure yet. It's been so yeah. darn cold. We don't know if they're alive in there. Yeah. Not that many, uh, okay. Not so, all right. So, so Valentine's Day typically. So this is Wasatch Front. Uh, a lot of my locations are up there still, but uh, typically we will have pollen coming in on Valentine's Day. I always write my little bee journal that I keep track of certain things in. Some things. Uh, I'm not sure if they're ever going to be useful to me by writing it down. We're told we're supposed to keep good records about things, and that will help us manage uh, whatever we're doing, beekeeping or something else, if we write stuff down and keep track of it. So some things that I've been doing uh, might help me later on, maybe not. 
but for fun anyway, I like to record the first day that pollen starts to come in in the springtime. So, so typically uh, pollen will come in uh, from uh, some of the bigger trees out there that have catkins on them. So uh, the first thing that I've generally noticed that blooms is silver maple. So that one's one of the, there's not a lot of nectar coming in from that, but there's a lot of pollen coming in. So, so I've got a list in mind of the trees that bees like first thing in the spring. So we always think of flowers when we think of uh, nectar sources for bees that they make honey from. But trees are some of, the, uh, some of the bigger flowering plants that we have that can provide a lot of nectar and a lot of pollen first thing. So we've got willows, we've got elms, We've got nine, and uh, let me back up on the willows. So some of the hybrid willows that are more popular like now don't seem to have as much pollen and honey on them. But some of the heirloom varieties of willows, so weeping willows, pussy willows, those are a really good source early in the year for honeybees. We've got box elder, they've got catkins. We've got uh, cottonwood trees, they'll have catkins on them. Those things, uh, those things will provide an early source. So you might come out in the, in uh, mid late February, and hear your your uh, your uh, cottonwood tree just buzzing, just a humming with no leaves on it yet. You don't even know it's even uh, budding out yet, and it'll be full of bees. So you have to have a beehive fairly close by for that to happen, but it will. So uh, so those are a few of the things. Yes. How many beehives do you think there are in America? Uh, well, let's see. I know uh, from our customer base, uh, I could I could take a guess and maybe times that by five or ten and uh, come up with a, ge a guess, but I imagine there's probably somebody on just about every block that's got one hive in their backyard, so if not every other block. So uh, um, there's a lot of bees that are outside the city limits in the commercial apiaries. So as you're driving around, you'll see a group of, uh, of hives that might have 20, 30, 40 colonies in it. But hobbyists that just around town inside Manti, I'd say you probably got uh, you probably got uh, a hive per every other block, maybe. That's just in my my estimate. So which is not enough. That's not enough. That's that's a whole lot of nectar that's going to waste. So there's probably uh, there's probably thousands of pounds of nectar just in uh, just in and around uh, Manti that go to waste every year because we haven't got bees to pick it up. So. That's, a, that's quite a resource that just uh, goes untapped every year. So we can't have enough bees. Not enough. The answer is not enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's start. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's go down the list from the beginning about what you need if you want. So let me, let me uh, back up a little. So if we have, uh, we know who has bees or has had bees or maybe has bees. Uh, who's planning on keeping bees this year? Okay, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, who's planning on catching a swarm? Okay. We'd like to catch a swarm. <laughs> All right. So, there's a couple different ways that you can get started with bees. So, at the top of the list, before we uh, we we talk about the beginning equipment, let's talk about securing bees. How are you going to get bees? So, so catching a swarm might be like going fishing. Well, maybe you'll get something. Maybe you won't. You never know, so uh, it's possible, uh, um, and that's a great way to do it. Uh, so not only, not always do you get an opportunity to catch a swarm, but sometimes you don't get them to stay in the box. So if you can catch a swarm, that's a great way to do it. They're great honey producers. Those bees that have swarmed out of somebody else's hive or out of a out of a tree, feral bees, right? They really know that, that they know that they've left everything, and so they instinctively really get busy and go to work. So you're almost guaranteed a, a good honey crop if you catch a good swarm of bees. So another way you can get bees is by package bees. They sell bees by the pound. They'll come in a cage, but they won't be on any comb or frame. So they come with a queen. It's mated. Usually those come out of California. That's another way to get started with honey bees. And then we also uh, have nucleuses, hive nucleus. So it's just a starter color, a starter colony. Uh, a uh, it's got all the things that an established colony has just in miniature. So a nuke will come on five frames. And uh, when we sell nukes, they come on, uh, on a frame that's this size. 
So, all right, so we're using we're using the standard Langstroth uh, hive, deep a deep hive. So, who's familiar with the word Langstroth? Langstroth was uh, back in the 1851 is when he designed uh, developed this size of frame, and so it's the most commonly used in the world ever since then, and uh, still is. So it's got it's got just a happy medium between what we need. Uh, for brood and honey and size for the beekeeper, it accommodates uh, all of us uh, uh, well all around. So uh, there's, uh, if you purchase a nuke, they'll come on five of that size frame. So well, that leads me up to what kind of equipment, once you've, uh, you've got the source of bees that you're going to purchase, what kind of equipment do you want it on? So if you're going to buy packaged bees, you could put them on a different size hive. So there's... Uh, the, uh, the trendy hive right now, I think, is the Lands Hive. Uh, a few years back, uh, people were really into top bars, uh, and then a lot of people have gone to a long Langstroth, a horizontal type hive. So, right, uh, Warray hives now are, uh, are a uh, vertical type of hive, but they uh, typically only have a top bar, and not a whole frame around the comb in them. So, there's a lot of discussion about the different types of hives there all are. You choose one, the bees, uh, the bees aren't going to object particularly to whatever hive you put them in. We want to make it uh, it's easiest, though, for, for you as a beekeeper. So uh, if you're not into e easy, if you've tried the Langstroth type hive and you want to try something else, go, go right ahead and do it. Uh, just know that if you're, if you're putting bees into a hive that you have that's something other than the standard deep Langstroth frame and hive, then you'd probably be better off obtaining your bees through a swarm, if you can, or packaged bees. Right. So, okay. All right, so if you're considering uh, which way you want to obtain your bees, uh, nukes are typically a little less risky. So we've already got a queen that's already laying eggs. She's already on some comb. She's already got honey in there, pollen in there, uh, worker bees, and some brood. The baby bees are already started. So if you get a, a nucleus, then you're uh, a little bit safer. It's a little... Uh, it, I want to say it depends on the time of year you get it, if it's a quicker start or not, right? So we won't have nucleuses that we offer for sale until May. Packages, generally, you can get those in April. So for here, sometimes the first week in April may be too soon. You get a package out of California that doesn't have any, any frames, right? Doesn't have any, uh, doesn't have any comb. You're starting out with new equipment. You're going to have to feed it, or it could starve to death. So uh, it's better off maybe getting the... Uh, a package of bees a little bit later on when you've got when all the fruit trees are blooming that's when you want your packages to arrive so if you can guess in the area where you're at it won't ever happen yeah <laughs> sometimes that happens uh, usually it doesn't uh, we feed them anyway we just make sure that we're prepared to feed bees anyway when we catch a swarm always feed your bees right when you get when you get uh, package bees to start out with in the spring you want to feed them and then uh, in the fall yeah so if you want to go to uh, the grocery store and get you a 25-pound bag of sucrose, table sugar, granulated sugar, that'll make a total of about three gallons worth of thick syrup, and that's what you want to feed your bees. You mix it into a syrup? Yep, right, so mix it with... Your, what are you so I won't give you an exact recipe. There is some, and there's a, whole, there's a lot of details about that uh, recipe that, be, that people like to... Uh, to refer to and follow what time of year to do this particular ratio or that. I'm just going to tell you, mix it up as thick as you can get it till it won't dissolve anymore and feed it to your bees. So, uh, so when somebody's put in front of an audience as a lecturer or somebody who knows something or is supposed to have the answers to something and is going to entertain questions, they tend to, tend to give you answers that maybe they, they don't necessarily apply always to, to themselves in real life. Right, and so I try really hard not to do that. I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to tell you the way I do it, and I'm not going to pretend to give you some book answer that's uh, that's going to be different than actual reality. So the reality is is that uh, that the uh, ratio of sugar syrup uh, to water uh, doesn't uh, doesn't really get followed that much. It's really hard to mix up uh, honey that. Uh, two to one, two parts sugar, one part water. You gotta mix forever and then you don't wanna heat it. Don't heat it up, don't, warm, don't boil it, whatever you do. Warmer water is a little bit easier. So just mix it up until it won't dissolve anymore and give that to your bees. Doesn't matter what time of year it is. Yeah. 
So that way we actually get it done without a lot of fuss. So, okay, let's see. I was talking, to, so maybe we're, maybe then now's the time to talk about feeders. Let's see where we're going. Yeah. Pollution. Right. Where do you put it? Okay. Feature right. So, uh, good, good way to. Okay. So, did everybody hear that? Once we've got sugar syrup to feed the bees, where do we put it? So, that's a good. I like the way you, you asked that question. We want to put it above the bees if we can. So, the heat rises off the cluster, and that'll warm the sugar up, the syrup up, and then the bees can be more likely to pick it up quicker if the syrup's warm. So, if syrup's cold, the bees won't pick it up, it'll cool their body temperature down. So early in the spring, let's say we've got package of bees and we got them a little bit earlier than the weather here when we were ready for. Fruit trees weren't out yet and, uh, and it's cold, so we're, uh, we're gonna feed them. So there's feeders that you can put in the entrance of a beehive and it's a, it's a bottle outside the beehive. So the bees inside can crawl into that underneath it and take it out. That's, uh, that's prone to robbing and it's prone to cool down in the sunlight. It's also prone to heat up. If the sun hits that glass jar outside, it'll warm it up. But when it gets cold, then the bees won't pick it up, right? So we've got feeders that you can put inside the beehive. You take out a frame and then you put in a tray in there that will hold syrup. You can pour it in there. So that's a... Uh, so uh, not exactly like a cookie sheet. So it's, uh, it's a trough. It's a feeding trough and the bees crawl down into it and pick the syrup about. So if the bees are clustered right next to that and it's inside the beehive, that stays a little bit warmer. But if we're feeding them when it's really cold weather, that can be a problem too. They won't, they'll, they'll, they'll be on the other side of the box in there and their feed's over here and they won't go over and get it. So where to put the feed if we had an upside down feeder. So we're gonna take a mason jar and we're gonna put, just poke a couple little holes in the lid. So when you turn it upside down, you get that suction, right? It'll drip out a little bit, but not, not all the way. It's thick enough in there. And we put that right on top of the frames, right on top of the bees, right? And then we could take another box and cover that up, right? So that's the, the best place to put feed is in a closed container so it doesn't start robbing. So the neighbor's bees or your other bees right next door don't come over and say, hey, I smell food over here. Let's go over and rob it. Take it back over here. So if it's in a closed container and there's just a tiny little holes in your lid upside down, then the bees can pick that up out of there as they will and it won't stimulate robbing. More, more on robbing later. That's, uh, that's a little bit past the beginning bee class and the amount of time. And so. if you want to know about robbing, we have our beginning beekeeping skills class yeah. and feeding bees is all in there like in yeah. detail. Yep. So I hope you never experience a robbing frenzy or at least I hope you experience one only on video instead of in real life. There can be be pretty yeah. So I'm I'm trying to visualize it. I have I put holes in holes in the lid. Yes. And put put the syrup inside the bottle. Yeah. Put put it upside down. Yep. And how do I put it? Put just put so pretend your bees are in here, right? Uh -huh. And here's the top bars on your hive, uh -huh. right? I'm just going to set it right on top, oh, right on top of there. Okay. So yep. Yep. Bees will crawl up through the frames, the in between the frames there, and they'll put their little tongues in the little holes you made for them in there and pull the syrup out. Got it. Right. Not too big a hole so it drips. We don't want it dripping out. But I it'll didn't know that it was a flatted top up there. That yes. Right. So that's, that's, that's what I thought. Right. So the bottom box has frames in it just like this. So there's not a bottom board in between each box as you go up. Right? They're open on the bottom. So the bees can crawl. They go in the entrance, crawl up through the frames over the honeycomb, and then up into the next box. And then up into the next box and into the next box. And speaking of the next box, let's talk about how much snow we got and how exciting that is. Right? So we're in for a really good year for honey. So if you've got bees, you're planning on getting bees, plan on getting some honey this year. So look forward to it. A lot of people will say to me, well, it's just my first year. I'm just starting these bees out this year, and I don't really have any drawn comb. I've just got foundation. I'm not going to take any honey from the bees this year. So some, some years that's, that's true. Uh, you, you know, you don't really harvest any surplus for the beekeeper, but a uh, year, like, year like this, there shouldn't be any excuse for not making some surplus honey. Those bees are going to go to work. There's going to be a ton of wildflowers out there. So, uh, We do, yeah. So, uh, yeah, if anybody, one of the bigger expenses you have of beekeeping is uh, extracting equipment. So a lot of people don't buy it. If they do get some extra honey, they're going to crush and strain it, right? Just let it drip through a cloth to collect honey. 
So come and borrow my extractor, right? We've got, I've got a couple of little small little hand crank ones. You can come and borrow that, spin your honey out, bring it back, and we'll and let somebody else use it. So if you need an extractor, yeah. After the first year, you know, when you started them feeding them on the sugar water? Yes. Yes, a a excellent idea. So we, when it comes time to harvest the honey in the fall, um, we make our best guess what surplus for us, the beekeeper, and what is it that the bees need to get through the winter we, that we leave with them. And so it's always good to maybe uh, uh, underestimate how much you're going to need, you, how much surplus is for the beekeeper, and, how much, uh, and overestimate a little bit how much we need to leave for the bees for the winter. So if you, uh, if you don't leave it inside the beehive, you could take a couple of frames that's uh, full of honey, capped over honey in fall, maybe put it in your freezer or even in the refrigerator and save it for March of the following year in case the bees run out, in case you didn't, uh, uh, in case it's a really warm winter and they, they eat up more uh, than they need, uh, or in case you decide uh, you, you caught a swarm. You weren't planning on increasing your apiary. You'd wanted just that one or two colonies that you had, but uh, now you've got more because uh, a swarm appeared. And what are you going to feed them? It got cold right after you swarm. You'll be glad you had an extra frame or two of honey out just in case for those kinds of things. So, so that's a good idea. Can you eat these things? Yeah. Uh, yes, of course. So, so bees prefer the the fresh stuff, right? They want to go fresh. They want to go for the fresh nectar when flowers are out. Honey's just their storage food. Right? That's just their survival food for the winter. And so they would prefer having, uh, they would prefer having uh, fresh flowers out. Um, but of course you can feed bees honey. Yep. So, so if you have an extra frame or two out and you want to use that to feed bees instead of go to the store and buy 25 pounds of granulated table sugar, uh, if you have a leftover frame of honey from the previous year, then that's, that's even better. Do that instead. Yeah. Okay, all right, so, yep. Uh, under sugar, would it be advisable to make sure it's cane sugar rather than beet, which might be GMO? So uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to put on my professor hat and tell you the chemistry of the difference between those two. I don't think there is one. I could quote you some things out of books. I'll, I'll quote you one out of books. Doesn't matter. It's, it's sucrose, right? Feed them sucrose. So it might matter how it's processed, but I'm not, I'm not gonna, I, don't, I'm, I can't go there. I don't know. So, so uh, sometimes, you, you know, there's not that big a difference in price. Sometimes I've seen cane sugar cheaper than beet sugar, but uh, so uh, I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah, I could give you, I could sound, uh, I could sound like I'm really knowledgeable here for a minute and tell you the difference between the two, but it, it'd mostly be just nonsense. All right, yeah. So during, okay, so uh, good, good question. So if, you, if uh, everybody heard that question is if we're going to feed the bees, how often do we need to feed them? How much do we need to feed them? So uh, we don't want to feed them in the wintertime. So bees have got to process the food uh, if we give it to them. And this time of year they're in a cluster. They're, uh, they're inside and they can't come out because it's too cold. So if we, uh, if we know something about bees' hygienic behavior, they don't like to mess inside the hive. So they're going to wait for a warm day before they come out for a potty break, right? And if we fed them, if we got in there and we put a bunch of syrup in there, and bees' natural inclination is to keep a tidy house, they want to clean that syrup up, they want to process it, they want to store it, they want to cap it over. Uh, if we make them do that, and then the weather's too cold for them to come out for a break after they've, uh, after they've uh, processed that food, now we've got some bees with potential dysentery. So, so to answer your question, come back is we don't want to feed them in the winter time. We want to feed them in the fall. Uh, so around here, that's going to be before the weather gets too cold for them to fly. So probably sometime November, we want to be done feeding them. They want, we want them to have that nectar, whatever we fed them, uh, syrup. Uh, we want them to have it reduce the moisture content in there. So now it's, it's, not, uh, it's not too uh, watered down. They've dried it out, they've stored it in some cells, 
and they've capped it over. Then it's prepared for winter time for their winter use. So you hear about uh, fondant or candy board sometimes in a beehive that you'll, they'll put on the front. So in the winter time, if you've got an emergency, they can go up there and eat some dry, some dry sugar, uh, a sugar cake. So that, that can be helpful in an emergency if you know what you're doing right, but let's, uh, let's, just, let's try not to do that if we can help it. Let's get them all that they need to eat before the weather goes bad. And then let's have that extra frame of honey that's already honey. It's, it's capped over, it's cured, it's dried. So if we do have an emergency, all we gotta do is put a frame of honey in there. We don't have to worry about mixing up syrup and taking it out there when it's too cold for them to pick it up. Right. So uh, around here, so we've got two boxes here. So we've got two deep boxes, and that's typically how we would send them through the winter time. So if you were somewhere north of here, let's say you were in Vermont or or uh, Minnesota or Canada or something, you may want even more honey than that in there. But typically, if you were to pick this up, it should going into winter. Let's say we're in November sometime, and we're done with our feeding. It should weigh about 100 pounds. So you don't have to pick the whole thing up if you can't just lift it, just lift the end of it and get an idea about how heavy it is, right? So make a mental note. Go out there in November and do this. And that's, uh, you know, how heavy it was going into winter time. Now if you want to go out there in the middle of winter, of course we don't want to open up the lid when it's really cold and get uh, messing around inside a beehive. But you could tell how much storage they've got in there by doing this in January. All right, December, a while they haven't consumed that much yet. We're not worrying about it. But let's say end of January, well, let's go do this. And then February again, come out and do this again. And make a mental note. Okay, is that a whole lot lighter than it was last time, or is it about the same? Make sure it's not frozen down, right? Make sure you're not picking up the <laughs> hive stand also, all right? And then come back in March. So they're going to start raising brood in uh, March. Uh, well, so the, uh, the go button for raising brood is really when pollen starts coming in. So if it fell, followed the average and it was February, we had pollen starting to come in in February, then they're going to start to consume more honey more rapidly than they were back in uh, December and January because they got a whole bunch more mouth to feed. And then as soon as that first, start, first round of brood starts to emerge, now they've got more adult worker bees, house bees at this time to, to feed, plus now they can even expand the, brood, the queen's brood chamber even more. So in March, that weight is going to go down rapidly. That's when we need to keep an eye on it. That's when you need to be ready with your, your extra frame of honey that you've saved. Or, or, that's, sugar or your sugar syrup in March is probably warm enough to feed them because they're going to get some days when they can come out and fly. So that's the time that you're going to want to feed them. So we keep an eye on, uh, keep an eye on them in March. So, yeah. Yep, right. right. He asked, so he, just a statement is, when's the best time to feed bees? All right, so we've finished feeding them. We get them all they need by November. And then uh, again, it, it would be appropriate for us to get in there and give them some liquid feed in March if they need it. They got plenty heavy. You go out here in March, and that's still really heavy. And it's a warm day, so your bees are flying. You pop the lid, and you look in there. And, oh, I got several frames of honey still capped over. Don't bother feeding them. This, you don't need to do that. Right, so that's the goal. The goal should be we don't we shouldn't be feeding bees, right? They should feed us, right? Isn't that why we're keeping them? Part of the reason. I mean, one of the main reasons we like honey. That's our incentive. We put up with some stings because we like honey. That's our uh, that's our main goal. Yeah. Do you ever use any pollen patties? Um, I've used them before. I've mixed up some of my own before, and uh, I don't know that I got that much gain. So. So uh, the commercial industry, if you looked at what they use, uh, we couldn't say that they're not effective. They don't, they don't have some benefits because a lot of people use them, and, but they're really stretching, uh, stretching everything they can to get uh, to manipulate the creature the best they can, right? Get them ready for almond pollination, get them brooding up as fast as they can in the spring. And so for our hobbyist pur purposes, uh, we don't really need to use them. Uh, they should have some pollen stored in there going into fall, and then they won't really start raising the brood in earnest until they've got more pollen coming in in the spring. So if there's pollen coming in, I would say you don't need to use a pollen supplement. So, yeah. So pollen, uh, just so for, so for everyone, everyone's uh, uh, information, if you're... Uh, if you know uh, the amino acids that build proteins, we've got to have amino acids to make proteins. 
So that's what the brood, the baby bees, need when they're developing from their larva stage into the pupa stage and then uh, shortly into adult bees. They are, they're building their bodies. So they'll need, they need the amino acids that comes in pollen to do that. So the uh, nurse bees that are feeding them will take pollen and then they'll mix it up with some honey and they'll mix it up with some of their, uh, their, own, uh, their own special baby formula ingredients, right? And then they feed it to the baby bees. So that's why we need pollen. That's what it's for. Yeah? You mentioned brood chamber. How do you define brood chamber? So a brood chamber is where the queen's laying her eggs, right? So we've got, uh, we've got uh, honeycomb, and in that comb, the bees can either store honey or they can store or they can raise brood, or they can store pollen, uh, all in the same uh, same bit. So I don't know if we've got uh, any pollen in some of these. Pass one of those around. Um, so in the center of the hive would be the brood chamber, and that's where they're going to want to regulate the uh, most specific, the temperature and the humidity to raise brood in. So just like uh, eggs in an incubator, chicken incubator, we got to keep it at a certain temperature. So they'll keep that together rather than having some brood in this box and some brood down in the bottom of this box. They'll, uh, they'll keep a uh, basketball sized brood chamber over several frames where they raise the brood. So nearby that brood they put, uh, they put a ring of pollen. They want it close by so it's readily available to the nurse bees when they're mixing up the baby formula. And then they'll have a ring of honey around that too. Typically honey will be above the brood chamber. So they organize the inside of their hive the way they want it, and the brood chamber is usually in the bottom. It'll start out in the bottom box, and uh, like as the season, season progresses, it'll get more. Yeah. That has honey around the edge. Yeah, there's honey around the edge there, and I think there's a little bit of pollen there, is there? Anyway, so that the queen would lay eggs in the center of a frame like that. So the brood chamber we define as the queen's territory. That's where she's doing the business of laying eggs, raising brood. Right, so each colony will have just one queen, or at least for most of the time she'll have just one queen. Sometimes uh, they'll be in the process of supersedure, so we'll have uh, one of her daughters working around, right alongside her when they're about to phase her out when they want a new queen. And then there's an occasion when they're gonna swarm, when they're gonna reproduce, we'll have more than one queen. But for the most part, the uh, colony only has one queen and the rest of them are worker bees. And then we've got drones also. So the drones, uh, the drones are the males, the worker bees are the females, as well as the queen. So, uh, uh, yeah. All right. Did I miss a question over there? I think I, I feel like I skipped somebody. Yeah. Where, where does the bee stay in the Yeah. Okay. I mean the queen. The queen bee. Right. All right. So let's start out. Let's uh, let's do this. Uh, let's start with. Um, We'll start with the bottom box. So on this box, unlike this, this other one here, sometimes we refer this to a super, all right? This one we have a bottom board on, okay? So this one sits on the ground. So this is your hive body. If we call, if we call this a hive because it's got a bottom board on it, uh, and this one we just call, we call this a super, right? All right, it could be used as a hive body also if we combine them, but we'll call this a super. That's anything we add above the hive body. So the bees are going to start out. Let's say you've got a swarm or you've got a package of bees or you've got a nucleus and start it out. The bees would be in this one box to begin with. So this is going to be, let me give you a time frame because I know you're going to ask. So we'll, we'll put the bees in one box. And then when they start to fill this up, uh, they'll start to uh, draw out all the comb, fill it up with honey. The queen bee's down here with her brood. Uh, it'll be uh, maybe uh, June first part of June, if we got our package bees in April, all right? And then after that, when they're, when they're getting, uh, getting close to running out of room, we'll come and we'll put another box on. So we've got this box on uh, into, uh, into uh, maybe the first part of July, all right? And after that, then we've got, we've got two, two boxes with bees, the queen bees down here, right? Mostly, sometimes she'll get up into here a little bit and lay in some of these frames. And then we've got honey and honey up here. Right? That's what we need for our bees for the winter time. Once they've filled up these two boxes, now if it's still early enough in the year and we've got uh, lots of snow and lots of flowers, 
Then we can put on another box. That's going to be surplus for us. The bees will put honey in that. We can take that off later in the fall. So, so I would be prepared, yeah, for, for more than just those three boxes this year. Yeah. Do you use a queen excluder? Um, so that queen excluder, if, uh, so what the question is, is a queen excluder. It's a screen that, is, uh, that has spaces in between the wires on that screen that are just big enough for worker bees to get through, but the queen can't get through it. So she's a little bit bigger. If you've, if you've seen pictures, you know uh, you've seen a queen bee before, you'll know that she's a little bit larger in size than the, the worker bees. And so to use a queen excluder, we put that over here and that'll keep her down here in the box below while the bees can go through, the worker bees can go through and store honey in the box up above that. So I typically don't use those for honey production. I just let the queen go where she wants. Some things that make it easier for me is because of the equipment I use. So I uh, use deep frames in my supers, uh, not just the brood chamber. So if the queen went up into the third box and laid eggs up here, no big deal. I just take this frame and put it back down there when it's time to harvest. So for a commercial beekeeper with hundreds of colonies, that's going to be trouble. You don't want to take individual frames out of the boxes in the field as you're taking honey off the bees back to extract it. So we want to get all the bees out of there. We don't want any brood in there. So it's a little bit different depending on how you like to vacate your supers in a, on a commercial scale. For a hobbyist, no big deal. Just get up here and if the queen went up in your third box, your fourth box, wherever, let her go wherever she wants, unrestricted, and then you can sort that out when it comes time to take the honey out. Just take the brood, put it down there, take the frame of honey out of here and put it up there. But so, if you're using different size boxes. Yeah, so if you're using different size boxes, of course a, a medium frame would fit in the deep box. The bees might draw a little bit of comb out on the bottom, big deal, let them do it. But you can't put your deep frame in your shallow box or your medium box, right? So, um, Did you say that boxes come in I didn't say, so we, uh, we did mention the different times of hives. So there are different sizes of the same, uh, the same size length of top bar, but a different distance on the, the, the side bars. The depth is different, right? So, um, so there's deeps, right? And then there's some mediums. There's, they're rather, rather than nine and five eighths, they're six and five eighths. And then there's shallows that are five and five eighths deep. Uh, and uh, then there's, there's even some others for comb honey that are even smaller than that. So what, so what that means is not only do you want to pick, stay with the size of hives that you pick, but the size of boxes within that hive that you, you pick, it makes it easier. So there's good reasons for not doing that. Some people just want two deep hive bodies and then they want, they want mediums up above that and a queen excluder. Do that if you want. So uh, uh, the queen excluder, I have some of those and I use them occasionally, but I don't use them for general honey production. It's a, it's a handy tool on occasion to isolate the queen bee where you want to keep her, uh, but I don't always use them. Another yeah. plug for deep boxes is that, or at least all the same size boxes, is that um, a lot of times you need an extra box or you need an extra hive, like if you need to split them or you cut a swarm or something, because any deep box can become a hive body by just putting a bottom board on the bottom. So like if you need to divide your colony in a screen that's growing really, really fast, then you can be like, okay, now I have another hive body. All you have to buy is the bottom board and then you're good. Or, you know, improvise <laughs> cardboard or something until you can get it. But yeah. that, that becomes a new hive really easily um, without having to buy a whole new set up. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So do you always attach your hive bottom to the bottom super? Uh, yeah. So if I wasn't going to move bees a lot, uh, then... I would, I probably wouldn't. So there's an occasion like in the springtime when you might want to, there'll be, they'll, the bees will be chewing on wax all winter long. There'll be hive debris and piled up down there and who knows a mouse might have got in there. You'll want to take it off the bottom board and just cl help them clean it out a little bit. There's an occasion that that's easier if you haven't nailed it down. So, yeah. So if, yeah, if, if you're keeping your bees, you're not moving them a lot. You're just leaving them in the same spot in the backyard all the time, then you really don't need to bother doing that. But when it comes time to move bees, it's really nice to have that uh, bottom board screwed down. I, I just put two screws in it, and that'll hold it, because I'm always loading them on a truck and moving them to different places. And it's just a personal preference. Yeah. Both ways work. Fine. So, yep. Do you, so our most popular video on YouTube is Queen 
bring up Dead Hive. Don't you watch it? Because it sh you show us how to clean all that up in that video. Yeah. So, which class, which course is that video in? Um, it is in the second course, Beginning of Beekeeping Skills. Okay. So, will you tell them about frames, like what they are? Uh, so, uh, yep. So, uh, if we have... Uh, People call this all different kinds of things, uh, which which is okay. We know what you mean, but it's it's the correct name is force frame. So it's got four sides that enclose the honeycomb uh, around four sides of wood. Typically, you can get them in plastic, uh, and it has foundation in in the middle of it, right? So other types of hive will have just the top more. So just this piece, right? And the bees will build comb down from that. So this is the easiest way to do it if you're if you have your comb inside of a frame rather than a top bar. So I'm not telling you not to, not to try a top bar if you want. Uh, there's benefits uh, if that's what you want to do, but I'm saying if you're starting out with bees, uh, it's probably easiest for you to start with the most standard, most commonly used, and if you're looking up information about beekeeping, you'll have the most resources, the most books, the most videos about the standard Langstroth type of frame rather than a top bar. So, um, if, uh, if, you'll, if you'll do that, you'll find it a lot easier to begin with, and once you've got a couple years of beekeeping experience under your belt, then you want to try a different hive, that's, uh, then, then I would do it. But I would start with this. So, another reason, yeah? So, when you use your extractor, yeah. that frame just go in there and it spins it out? Yes, thanks for bringing up the tools. So, that was my next point, maybe that was yours too? Oh, Yeah. Home to the sides of the box, and so we've we've just seen um, people that are new to bees and maybe a little intimidated, who were too scared to get in there and like cut that apart because you have to cut it apart to get the frame out, and so their bees died <laughs> because they couldn't get the combs out, right? So that having those side bars and bottom bars, at least when you're starting out, is a good idea because then you can just pull the frame out anytime you want, right? Yep. That's, that's, that's one of the benefits to, to doing that. So also the tools. So um, if you were to read up, and, and our videos and our instruction too also uh, uh, goes with most of the industry that the techniques that you're being uh, given for keeping bees and the tools that you'll use to keep bees revolve around the Langstroth frame. So extractors, when you put it in an extractor and it spins the honey out, um, it's best if that comb is enclosed in a frame like this. And so uh, a lot of the ways of manipulating a hive th through the different seasons, raising queen bees, they all, uh, they all are done best uh, by, um, by using the, the standard length of this frame. So if, uh, now, so having said that, doesn't mean, doesn't mean you can't keep bees in another hive. Go right ahead and do it. Uh, so I've invented my own, my own kind of hive. It revolves around that frame, but it's different, and it's, it's fun to do that. So some of the reason why we keep bees is just for fun. Beekeepers love their gadgets, right? They love to invent new pieces of equipment, and uh, that's, that's just part of the fun. That's part of the hobby. So please do that. So in fact, if you're really serious, deep into bee culture, You've been doing it for a long time. You've got to invent your own hive. Yeah. So wait, wait until you've got quite a bit of experience under your belt before you do that, right? So, and I mean more than three or four years, you know. 20 years from now, and you've explored all these different things, and you've tried half a dozen different kinds of hives, then, then design your own hive. Do it. It's fun. So, yeah. Can we talk about the bottom board structure, too? Okay. Like, yes. And then the lid. Oh, yeah. Okay. Bottom boards and lids are coming up next. Yep. Have you seen much difference in using plastic foundation versus using the wax foundation? Uh, yes, bees love plastic. Really? Yep, they love drawing comb out on that. They love sticking comb to it. If you have your, uh, you have your hive, so you'll, you'll see that they like to glue everything down with propolis and wax in there. And you put your lid on like this, and then you take your hive tool, and you're going to go to pry that lid off. And you had a couple of frames in there that were plastic frames instead of wood frames. Those are the ones that stuck down. They'll glue it right to the hive, and then when you go to take your lid off, you pull it up with your hive like this, and then it drops the bees down like that, and then they get mad at you. They, they love plastic. So this foundation in here is plastic, and uh, 
So if we use a food grade plastic, I wouldn't be, uh, I'm, not af I'm not afraid to use some plastic in there. All right, we've got something that's stable and the bees aren't really chewing on it, they just like to build wax on it. So you, there's plastic hives, there's plastic frames, and typically we use a lot of plastic foundation anymore. Uh, so, yeah. The, they like it when it's covered with beeswax, though. Yeah. If it doesn't have beeswax on it, they don't like it. Yeah, we, we spray a little light coating of uh, liquid beeswax on there to get them started on that plastic foundation, and then they'll build, they'll build on it just fine. So. The spray, uh, so uh, we would just uh, melt down our own. You're just going to have to get beeswax if you wanted to do that. You'd melt, down melt it down, and so if you have just a few colonies, I would just get a brush, and uh, and then let's say you had just the foundation, right? Get it to uh, liquefy it, and take it and brush it on there. But it so comes, you could, it comes already like that. yeah. When you yeah. buy plastic foundation, it'll come already. There's, there's one kind of plastic foundation. Yeah, there is. There is. Yeah. Uh, so while we're on the subject, uh, so this might be a little confusing for people. It's it's, but they make lots of different types of foundations. So it used to be uh, just wax, right? And they'd run it through a a, a mill, a roll, and it would emboss that hexagon shape on there as it comes out, and then they cut it into sheets that fit inside of your frame. And so uh, um, you'd have to put wires in there, support it, or otherwise the beeswax would get hot with the weight of the bees on it and it kind of sag and it would distort the uh, hexagon shape, cause some trouble sometimes. So uh, then they started to use, uh, started to use more plastic and, uh, and then, uh, um, so uh, what, I, what I was going to say is that there's lots of, there's different types of foundation, right? And so the plastic, you've got wax, you've got uh, a piece of, you've got frames that are all one piece. So there's, uh, there's uh, not a difference between the frame and the foundation. It's all molded into one piece. Um, yes. And so they, uh, they'll, huh? Can you take apart and show them down Yeah, you can pop, so you can pop that out of there. So. This is just a sheet of plastic right. that comes separate from the frame. Yeah. So uh, you can buy you can buy your frame separate, and then you can decide on the type of foundation that you want to use with it. So, but Duraguild uh, is a brand name, and it's it's just slick plastic. It doesn't have the hexagon on it, and then it has solid beeswax uh, hexagon shapes uh, on either side of it. So it's sandwiched inside of uh, of of uh, real beeswax. So it makes it less likely to sag, uh, less makes it a little bit more. Uh, uh, it makes it quicker for the bees to dry out comb on, right? But the problem is, is that if they take it down to that slick plastic, if they chew that down for some reason, which quite often happens, then they won't rebuild it. So well, I, I don't know why that stuff's still on the market, really. It's kind of a bit of a trouble, but don't, don't worry yourself that much about that. That's not, a, that's not that big a deal. So it's normal, just plastic foundation. Yeah. Like yep. So those are the things. So if you're ordering components to your beehive, well, we used to manufacture all our own and sell our own, but when we moved from Provo, uh, we lost most of our customer base up there. There's just not enough people down here that are keeping bees to justify maintaining a shop and running a, uh, running a, a full wood shop making stuff. So we, we just focused on some other things instead. So, but as you're ordering, as you're ordering your equipment, you, can, you gotta decide on, on whether you want plastic frames or wood frames and uh, wax foundation or plastic foundations. Those are some of the uh, components that you need to put together. So before I get off there, I thought a couple of times I need to say, um, unless if I wasn't clear earlier. So this year, typically we would sell a kit, which would be three boxes high, and that's generally enough for your first year. Um, this year I would, uh, I would suspect that you might need four. Be prepared for four, because we're gonna get a lot of honey. So if your bees aren't progressing uh, fast enough in the summer, to fill up four boxes by the end of, let's say, by Labor Day, then there's something there's something uh, that's not going right there. So we need to, if you're uh, if you're following. So if we were to tell people to follow uh, where your bees should. So let's say um, you you uh, Alicia, will you give them uh, give them the time frame? Let's say they purchased packages from us, or they purchased nuke from us. About uh, about uh, where would they be? Um, as far as uh, the time they progress 
how many boxes would we need through the season? When's it going to be the next to, uh, time for next season? So, and the reason we have this in our videos, we have some instruction like this, is so if you purchase bees from us and something started going wrong from the very beginning, right? We want to make sure that you get off to a good start. We're going to guarantee your bees for the first little bit, but you've got to make sure that they're off and running. So you can follow our videos, the time outline that we've given, and some of that will be in the 52 emails that we're going to be sending out each week, right? So that's dependent, of course, on weather and your specific location. We might be off a little bit, but we're going to tell you throughout the season about how far your bees should be progressing, what they should look like at a certain time of year. And if they're not following that roughly, then we know there's something wrong, you need to get it fixed as early as you possibly can in the year before it's too late in the summer. If it's midsummer, summertime anyway, we're probably not going to be able to, to do anything about it. So yep. where would they find that? Where would they find those uh, lessons in our, on our, in our instruction videos? So you'd want to sign up for uh, the, free, the free class, then you get those 52 emails. So sign up for the free class. That's kind of the best way to follow the progress through the season like that. And the, but you'd find it in the beginning so that you can steal um, course. I guess so. How how are we doing? Is uh, people uh, are we uh, are people thinking, following along? Or are you getting bored? Or are you getting tired? Or do you want to keep going? <laughs> okay. Tell about nine. Okay. All right. We got some time left. So we we plan these. Uh, you know, it takes it looks to uh, two hours. I would say for us to really even just really get uh, going good and cover a part of the beekeeping industry um, uh, and but usually it goes spills over so we're we're accustomed to just keeping on going for like three hours if you want yeah I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it for you hang on go ahead So that was just about emails and contact information. Everybody got that? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the promotion on our B courses. Appreciate it. So we, have, we got a little discount. Uh, we've timed that so that uh, uh, people can still get a discount uh, while they're ordering the bees this spring if you want. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we don't sell a kit anymore. Sorry, we'll just sell bees. So bee prices, we can give you those. Yeah. So do you mean a kit by like a colony of bees? Like maybe... Right. So we don't sell the, the uh, woodenware or the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, smokers or the hats and veils. We used to sell those. We don't anymore. So what we have available for sale right now, we do have a, quite a few products. And quite a few of them are, are unique to the honey company. You can't get them anywhere else. But mostly what we sell now is bees and later in the, in the season honey. So we've got a price. So our price on packaged bees is 160 right, for a three pound package. And we've got the same price for nukes. So uh, if, you, uh, if you want to, the, the benefit uh, for nukes is obviously worth a little more than packages, but you can get your packages earlier is one reason why you might choose a package bees over nucleuses. So, and then we have a two pound package also, which is sufficient enough bees to get you started. It comes with a mated queen, everything, just a few less bees, just a little bit slower start. But uh, often in the springtime, you're gonna be feeding them anyway. And uh, by the time the weather's up and really rolling and the main nectar flows on, it doesn't make any difference. So those are 140, what? two pound package bees. Yeah, one $140 for a two pound package of bees. So that's those are the main things that we have for sale that we, we're offering at the honey company this year. So, all right, so uh, since you asked though, so about equipment, you're gonna need to find some equipment elsewhere if you don't already have some. So you'll need to purchase the uh, lid for your, for your hives. You'll need a lid. Um, there's the bottom board on here. You'll need a bottom board. I wouldn't recommend getting a screen bottom board, um, just a solid bottom board. 
and then you're going to need one, two, three at least, maybe four boxes depending on the type of hive you're using. You'll have to adjust that if you're keeping in something different other than a deep Langstroth. You adjust that volume for what you're doing. All right, but that's uh, anticipating that we might get a uh, might get two uh, a couple of extra boxes of surplus honey this year. We're always hopeful. So who knows? It might dry up uh, completely in June and and uh, all 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 the water floods off and goes to Delta, and that's the end of it. Who knows? So. <laughs> So I say that not to be pessimistic, just to be realistic about agriculture. Every year is different. So, we, yeah. so say they buy their hives, yep. they buy bees, yep. where, how do they decide where to put it? Like, where do they put it in their yard, or okay. are they taking it here? Right, so the uh, next thing you want to discuss is where you're going to put your hive once you've got it. Right, so you'll try to make the decision before, I I before you, uh, <laughs> bef uh, <laughs> that's Siri can't answer that one. It's all right. I can. I got. I got you covered. <laughs> so, uh, so we want to find a place that this time of year would be nice to have sun in the afternoon, so those bees can get some thermal gain. So you're going to be getting your hives in the springtime, and you're not going to be thinking about almost the whole next year. But let's think about wintertime too. So since we're there right now, we want a place that's uh, uh, out of the deep, deep snow. So I had some bees up in Bird's Eye. Oh, we couldn't find them. <laughs> there was a little bump there, but we didn't know if it was sagebrush under there or if it was a beehive. We had to dig. When we've got that video posted, you want to watch that one just for fun. So uh, you make sure. In. Yeah, we had we did. We literally had to snowshoe in. I mean, it was up to here. We had to get the horses out of there. It was an emergency. They were up to their bellies in snow, and uh, so. Anyway, find a place that's uh, that's not going to get. They're not going to get buried in the snow drift. Right, so usually, uh, usually in the valley like this, we're not. But who knows? We got people keeping bees up, uh, up at their cabin, up at Fairview or wherever. You know, you might, uh, you might have them in that deep of snow. So let's get them on a hive stand. Let's get them up on some pallets or two. Get them off the ground, right? And then we're going to find a place that's got some sun in the afternoon, on in the winter time, and we're going to find a place that has some shade in the afternoon in the summertime. Uh, we're going to try to find a place that uh, is ideal, which we can hardly ever do. But if you've got the ideal spot for it, this is what we're looking for. So in other words, what I just said about shade, let's say you had a deciduous tree on the west side, so it loses its leaves. Now we've got some sunlight coming in for the winter time on, that, on the hive. Um, and uh, so we've got, uh, you might need a windbreak. Maybe you can put it by a, a conifer tree that acts as a windbreak, or you can put it on a fence where the prevailing winds from that are going to come from southwest might not uh, hit it. Um, we're going to want to face the colony so that it gets some warmth early in the springtime. So uh, if we can warm the bees up earlier in the day and get them to work earlier, that's a benefit. So, but facing them east and the wintertime may not be the best thing if, if, if because we want them facing more at the hottest time of the afternoon, if it gets hot, uh, warmest anyway, we'd want them facing maybe southwest, so they're getting that afternoon sun. So if we faced it south, it'd still get some light, some warmth from the morning east rising sun on the porch, warm up the bees, get them going to work earlier, and uh, so that'd be the best, to, uh, so the ideal. Now if, you're gonna, if you don't have the choice, face them south. So, but if you don't have that option, it's not the perfect place for them to face the hive that direction, and you have to face them north, are they going to die? No, they'll probably do just fine. So we're just talking about ideals here. Where's the best place to put them? All right, let's put them out of the way of livestock. Goats like to jump on hives, um, uh, and uh, horses sometimes will kick them over. Uh, usually not. Cows will rub on them. I've lost, I've lost a bunch of hives. They'll flip the lids off and knock them over. I had some cows look like a bear went through the yard a couple years ago. Yeah. They, they ate it. They ate the comb. They ate the, they were, I don't know, a couple of calves in there just looked like a bear. So bears, we've got bears too. Don't put them someplace if you're going to put them up the canyon. So uh, uh, sometimes we have some old honey that people give me, you know, back in the cans when they put honey in metal cans back in the 70s. And I have people that will call me and say, hey, I've got this storage. It's leaking. It's rusty. What do I do with this old honey? Can you feed it back to bees or do I throw it at the dump? And so I said, no, uh, occasionally I'll... I'll, you can use those, feed them to pigs. 
Uh, bears, so my neighbor just uh, happened to come down. And I, I take those because I know somebody's going to want it for something. And so my neighbor, sure enough, had a bear permit just up uh, Skyline Drive up here. They got one, uh, so we used the honey for that. Anyway, so, so now we've, we've uh, got the bears up there. They killed that one, but there might be others that know that there's honey. <laughs> know that honey because we've been, uh, we've been uh, putting hives up there or using honey for that kind of thing. So, so you might have to have a bear fence. I don't know. Probably not. Try to find a place that you don't have to deal with bears. All right, let's see. What's some other, other considerations for uh, putting bears? So you want to put them out of your flight path. So if you've got them in your backyard, put them someplace where they're not walking in front of where they're trying to fly all the time. So stick them in a corner where they have to fly up and over a fence maybe. You don't want to put them too close to the fence so they're in the shade all the time. But if you've got some obstacle where they can fly out of the hive and up when they go out foraging, then they won't be in, in the, in the uh, yard with, uh, with people traffic, with kids playing, with pets, whatever. So put them someplace out of the flight path. Don't face the entrance toward the swing set. That's yep. the rule. <laughs> right. uh, let's see. We need a water source. If you can locate them by a water source, that's best. They'd like a water source that's closer than maybe a quarter mile. They don't like to go too far away for water. So uh, if you uh, if you have a choice of locations and they're both they're both equally good and one's got water where you're not going to have to worry about water for them, they can get their own without being a nuisance to your neighbors. Uh, and put them there. They need water. Yeah. Do, do, do uh, sprinklers that are used consistently work as a water source? Uh, yeah, no, uh, yes and no. So consistently uh, means is there a leak? Is there always a little leak spraying out there? Yes, sprinkler that's perfect. Leaks. That's perfect. Leaks, leaks are yeah. awesome. But you may not want them in your sprinkler or leaking all the time. So we don't want sprinklers hitting the bees. Uh, right, we don't want we don't want something like that agitating them. So okay. if you've got a sprinkler on or a timer and it comes on in the nighttime and your beehive gets wet, that's a no-no. They might just up and leave on you. So we don't want them, we don't want the bees to abscond. We don't want them to swarm away. So put them somewhere they're not getting bothered every night by a skunk or a sprinkler or uh, some other by a, uh, heavy equipment that's going driving right by them and vibrating the ground all the time. Well, okay, what I miss? There's other things too. What I miss? There's a question. Where, uh, yeah. I've had hives where I've had animals fairly close and yep. I've had a trough out there with water in. Yeah. I found that I like to put a board in there. Yeah. That they have a landing place, otherwise, you drown a lot of them. Yeah, so bees don't like to drink right out of the open water, really. They prefer mm -hmm. the damp water that's along the edge, that's in the mud. So putting a board is a really good Yeah, so if you've got a situation like that where there's no damp water, it's just in a trough, you might want to put a raft, put a life raft in there for them. So put something in there that floats so they can hang on to and crawl out of them, dry off and fly away. We used um, old foundation last summer, like, because it's plastic, it floats in the trough, and then those little divots are like the perfect depth for them to get little drinks out of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you want to discuss anything about moving them? Because I've been told you shouldn't move them less than a mile. But I've had bees return back Yeah. if I wasn't too off far away. Right, so moving bees. Uh, <coughs> a friend of mine moved his bees from one side of the yard to the other in the middle of the summer, and they went back to where the hive was. They get a fix on their location. So if the bees had got a fix right on here, and I moved them just this far away, they'd be over here buzzing around, wondering where the hive was. And, and they get mad about that too. So he actually lost his bees. He had to get rid of his bees because Orem City, uh, because the neighbors got stung so many times that they called up the city and the city said, okay, your bees are a nuisance. You're, you can't keep bees anymore. You have to get rid of your bees. And we don't want to see any of your equipment on your property either. Otherwise we might suspect you have bees. So you have to get rid of all your stuff. So, yeah. My profession has been insurance for yeah. 48 years. Yeah. I've never had it come up, but are there are public liability issues yeah. for owning a hive. If the neighbors do get stung, yeah. can they sue me? Right. So most of the time when I lose a location, it's over a water issue. So rather than, uh, rather than get in a fight with people, I found it easier just to move the bees to someplace else. But best yet would be to let's just not let the problem get started in the first place. So if your neighbors, and it's usually a swimming pool, 
uh, sometimes a bird bath or some water feature they've got around. So let's give them uh, let's give them some water and keep that water source replenished so it doesn't run out and then they'll go over to the neighbors to get a drink. So so you never know. Some some people are, oh fine with the bees over there. We love it. And can we buy some honey from you? And other people are deathly allergic and scared to death of bees. They're going to want to sue you because your bees are going over there. It might be a so. good idea to put your hives in a place where your neighbors aren't like looking out and worrying about it. Yeah, so, okay, so good. another good point on, I'm coming back to your moving hives. I haven't got away from you yet. You have so, five minutes, though. Okay, so we got, uh, we've got uh, uh, the issue of, of bees. So there's going to be bees in the neighborhood. So, so if they're going to sue you because your bees stung them, well, how do they know it's your bees for sure? Were they right in your hive when they got stung? Let's, you know, look. Let's just try not to even go there, okay? Let's just be smart about this. Let's first of all put the hive someplace where your neighbors aren't going to see it, all right? Then they're not going to know where those bees are coming from. They might be your bees, they might not. We don't know. But there's going to be bees in every day. You asked me earlier, how many hives do you think there are in Manti? There's some, they're everywhere. Yep, there's not enough of them, but they're everywhere. So we don't, we don't know for sure where the bees are coming from. So if somebody really wanted to get uh, specific about uh, bee lining them back to your apiary, we, they probably could. We have videos about that too, right? <laughs> but so, let's, but let's, it's, it's the natural state of bees yeah. to like fly out and be on things, so usually it's not a liability because of the natural state. That's why your neighbor can plant quaking aspens and they can come up into your yard and yeah. it's the natural state of quaking aspens and you can't, mm -hmm. you can't kill them or you're liable, right? Like it's just because of bees fly out and so that's probably the like the legal answer at least when I, I worked for Utah State for a while and that was when people um, asked it was a lot about quaking aspens <laughs> but th I did research and I found out that that was the law that you couldn't somebody couldn't get in trouble for a natural thing to be doing its natural you know state yeah if that makes sense Let's come back. I'm two, I'm two questions behind here. Come right back to you. So we were going to move bees first. Uh, unless, uh, so we finish up the topic first, though, of, uh, of uh, watering bees. Okay. Just yeah. make sure they have water. All right. All right. We'll be right back to this. So we're going to move bees, though. So one of the things you might encounter is, let's suppose your bees did get, you got a neighbor complaining, and we got to move them. All right. How are we going to go about that? So uh, it's best to move bees at night. So all the bees are out foraging during the day, right? And then if it's not a stormy, overcloud, cloudy day when no, no bees are out, we want to wait until nighttime, then they'll all be in the hive. So then we can put something in the entrance that won't suffocate them, stuff some, uh, stuff some uh, gunny sack in there or a cloth or something, put a screen over it, right? We pick them up, put them in our truck, and then move them someplace else. So we want to use plenty of smoke when we do that, right? Calm them down, get them in there eating the honey, fill up on the honey before we move them. And then be careful, you know, when you're picking them up, not to drop them, handle them as gently as you can when you're going to move them. So there's some exceptions to uh, exceptions to moving bees, though. Right now, this time of year, if you needed to move bees, you could just pick them up in the middle of the day and move them. So it's they're not flying. They're not flying anyway. We're not going to lose any filled filled bees behind. They're in a cluster. If you're real gentle about it, you could pick them up and move them, and we wouldn't worry about them coming back. Now, even, now, I mean, move them is you can move them from here, this time of year, right over to here. And they wouldn't come out a month from now and be over here wondering where the hive went. So if they're locked in there for a couple of weeks, they're going to automatically want to come out and redo their orientation. So they seem to forget where they were if they've been locked in for a couple of weeks. So if it's springtime weather and it's, it's you know bad weather, the bees aren't even flying for two weeks, well, go ahead and move them from one side of the other of the yard to the other one if you want. You so, don't have to move them a uh, substantial distance away. So do you want to say three miles for three days? I don't want to say three miles for three days, but that's a good idea. That's a good rule. Right? It usually doesn't really have to be that far, but uh, you want to consider their foraging hour area might be a couple of miles. Right? We want to move them at least that far away so they don't come back to their own location. So the idea yeah. is if you have to move them across the yard, you pick yeah. them up, you move them three miles away, leave them for three days, mm -hmm. then bring them back to the other side of the yard, and then they won't get mad and stay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they'll reorient three fly days and then come back. But it's not exact. You don't, it doesn't have to be three miles for three days. It could be two miles for two days or just long enough that, and far enough away that they'll yeah. have to reorient. Right. 
it when does. they go away and reorient when they come back. Mm. Those are going to be three rainy days? No, it has to be three <laughs> fly days. Three fly days. They've got to come out and say, oh, we're someplace new. We'll get a fix on our new location and then come back and then you can move them again. But we say three miles per three days because it's easy to remember. Yeah. That's right. It's a, that's a foolproof distance, goof proof distance and time if it's fly days. We did a video recently where he moved them in the middle of the day and then he put a catch hive in the oh. spot where they were. And it was amazing how there were like two pounds of bees that left, you know, that were out foraging and came back at night into that catch hive. So you really do, if you move them in the daytime, you really do lose a lot of your workforce. So you want to move them at night for sure. Or stormy, when they're not flying anyway. Um, and then we probably ought to let people who want to go <coughs> home <laughs> go, and, but we'll stay after to answer some questions. Would that work? Jim? Sure. If you, if you need to leave, go ahead. You can get up and leave. We won't hurt our feelings. We'll just keep okay. answering questions here for a while yet. Yeah. Okay, I have two quick questions. One, yep. um, the time, how much time per week are you going to be involved in this? Is there free time to be able to go away for a week for business and come back? And, right. And then the other one is, if you could mention some of the benefits of honey. Okay. Yes, okay. So that question was, how much time is it going to take to keep bees? So they're not like a cat or a dog or a pet that you've got to, uh, that you've got to attend to every day. Right? You're, they're not like livestock that you've got to feed every day. So you can take a vacation if you want for a couple of weeks and not worry about it. So if it's in the middle of a honey flow, throw another box on there and go on vacation. Right? So there's certain times of year when you need to be more attentive than others. This time of year, winter time, there's nothing for you to do for a couple of months. You know, you make sure they're fed in November, and you stay out of there until, you know, go out in February and see how heavy they are. So the rule yeah. of thumb of that, which it doesn't have to be exact, but every seven to ten days is when you want to inspect. That's to prevent laying workers from forming, which is a problem that hives can have if you neglect them for like a long time. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, thanks for coming. And what are some of the benefits of, of honey? So, uh, so honey's the best sugar for you, so it's not refined. And so there's lots of health benefits. So there's there's books uh, about benefits of health, uh, health benefits from honey. So I'm just going to have to refer you to one of those because we don't. Uh, uh, we could talk. Uh, we could talk all night about health. Is there, is there a particular one you like? Um, yes. Yeah, so there are. So there's all the different sugars are in honey. And so there's some that uh, people that maybe have a problem with. Uh, with uh, glucose levels, and maybe diabetic, so they can find some, some uses uh, of different varieties of honey that don't spike their blood sugar as much as other ones. So some of them, some of them are worse. Some of them they'll just throw you into a, a sugar days right away, and then other ones are a lot, uh, a lot more stable. So uh, I know you know, almond honey never really spiked my blood sugar. Get that sugar. So it's kind of vague. Like, uh, yeah, so it depends on the nectar source. Maybe you can get some some honey sources, and, and they're all different. They have different levels of glucose in them compared to the other, other sugars in them. And so uh, you just have to look up the glycemic index. Uh, you can find one that's that specific. I mean, it'll, it'll tell you what honey is compared to other fruits, whatever, other, other things with sugar in But some, but I don't I'm not sure if there's a study out there that's really specific on the different varieties of honey, but I know there are some. So, uh, almond honey, I know you can eat, you can eat that, and it doesn't it doesn't give you that up and down sugar fix. It's more steady. It's kind of a bitter sweet. Okay. So there's some honeys that are like that. And you mentioned there's a number of books that tell them about this. Is there one that comes to mind specifically? Uh, <laughs> yes, I, and I have a little paperback. It's been around forever. I think it's Honey and Your Health is one. Honey is the one. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one. Uh, there's every other month there's another article about how healthy honey is in the beach. Well, that was interesting. I, 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 if you Google that, it you can Google it. Yeah. Yeah. And there are bee journals. Yeah. So there's bee periodicals, yeah. So there's a bee culture, that's a monthly magazine. Okay. And then there's American Bee Journal. Okay. Those are the two we have in this country. Okay. And then there's a bunch of others too. Canada, the Judea. Excuse me, real quick. I yeah. just wanted to say oh. thank you oh, for you the bet. great presentation. I really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, the time. thanks for coming. I'm glad you could make it. So, My pleasure. Thank good you. to see you. Yep. Um.
if you talk about people robbing, yeah. is that where uh, another high will come in and say, you know what, yeah. I'm just going to take this guy? Right, so typically in the fall, when, so we've had a, a good cold snap, and it's killed off most of the flowers, and most of the flowers are done for the year, it's the time of year, but it's still warm enough for the bees to fly. Okay. It's still up to you know, 50 degrees and more work in November. Uh, then the bees are out buzzing around, but there's nothing for them to do. So they'll go find another colony each week, and they'll rob it out. They'll just barge in there and pass so the garbage. So it's because and it's a weak hive, not yeah. because... Of yeah. Usually, I've had some big, strong colonies that got robbed out, too. Uh, that can happen. Does so, it uh, kill them? The yep, they'll get in there and they'll they'll just wrestle. You'll see them fighting with uh, the guard bees, and they'll overpower the guard bees, and they'll just run in there and start uh, hauling off honey as fast as they can. So if it's a call you that may be bigger and stronger, but it's not more aggressive, it's not more uh, doesn't have more guard bees on duty, then some other bees that are that are a little bit more inclined to rob can wipe it out. So that happens. So you want to reduce entrances in the fall when there's uh, flowers are done. When there's a potential for robbing, you introduce Yeah. You block it so yeah, like this right here. That's kind of an introducer. So I blocked up half of the entrance, and so it's a smaller area, so that it takes fewer guard bees to defend it. Yeah. So put your so entrance they can use reduce. A, uh, mount a good defense and have a smaller. Area. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, do you have a business um, We might. Uh, there should be. Did you get a handout? I did, I did. It should be on there. I'm out okay. of, I don't know if I got any cards on it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. Do you know the people that are uh, I know who that is. I don't think I've ever met him. But I know who that is. Is so that a prickly pear or something they call him? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. There's not a lot of commercial beekeepers down here. It's just not that great a place for bees. This is not that great. Not that great a place for bees. I should have, I usually mention that earlier too. San Pete County is just kind of a difficult place to keep bees. So we have well, most of my locations are still up in Provo, Utah County. Is that because more yards? More yards, more ornamentals around people's yards, you know, they're not just one crop alfalfa and then it's cut before it blooms and you're all done and you know, and it's warmer up there. So it's just, uh, it seems uh, a little bit of a place. How do you keep a light, a light in the window? Yeah. What's the secret? So the secret is uh, two, two things that are main thing. Make sure they got plenty of food. they got plenty of honey right going in into it. Right? Yep. So if they're heavy enough, you're lifting that, and it's heavy enough, over 100 pounds at least uh, in November, then you'll be okay. And they got to be going into winter disease-free. So we talked briefly about some of the bee pests, mites. Make sure you get the mites out of there earlier in the fall. Sorry. So if they're